This is my custom built PC, which happens to feature the same specs as what Apple compared the new M1 Ultra chip to at their event. What a funny coincidence. And this is the Mac Studio that Apple says can beat it. It really is quite a matchup here, sort of a David versus Goliath situation. But the question for today is, comparing these two, is it even possible? And is the Mac Studio actually faster than all of this? Well, we are going to be finding out. So make sure to leave a like down below, get subscribed. This is a fun one. Today's video is sponsored by Hopestar. Their 27 inch 144 Hz monitor offers a fresh and minimal design with a clean stand, lightweight housing with ultra thin bezels, and an anti-reflective display coating. It also comes with a really simple VESA mount on the back of it if you decide to mount to your own monitor arm instead of using the included tilt adjustable stand. With HDMI 2.0, DisplayPort 1.2, USB, and 3.5 millimeter headphone jack on offer, you have all the connectivity you could need. The 144 hertz refresh rate allows for smooth gameplay and OS navigation, and the panel offers 178 degree viewing angles. And the best part, this monitor is extremely affordable, costing less than $130. A 144 hertz panel at that price point is very strong value. So if you're intrigued, check out the link in the description below. And now let's get back into the video. Comparing this Mac Studio to this PC is not a straightforward job. It's not exactly an apples to apples test, get it? They are extremely different in terms of their intended function, target audience, upgradability, operating system, architecture, Pre pretty much everything is very, very different. And yet Apple straight up said, hey, this is faster than this. So to get an idea of if their claims stack up, first we need to get an idea what systems we're comparing. Making this PC was sort of a patchwork quilt situation. I actually built it over a year ago, but hadn't made the upgrade to Alder Lake. That is, until Apple made their comparisons at the event. At that point, I felt it was necessary to get a frame of reference and build out what Apple says they can beat, except with two caveats. First of all is my case. The H510 Elite I got on sale was fine when I had an air-cooled 10700K, but with a 12900K, I needed to go AIO, and you can't really mount anything more than 280 millimeters on the front of this case, so I really had to squeeze that cooler in there. The H510 is also notoriously not that well ventilated, and because of the cramped design, I ended up using the case fans on my AIO because there just wasn't room for the fans that came with it. Furthermore, there's the RAM. Look, I'ma be real with you guys, it would have been many hundreds of dollars extra to get 64 gigabytes of DDR5, as well as a motherboard that could accept that, so I just stuck with DDR4 3600 MHz RAM. Both of these caveats should benefit the Mac Studio, so we're giving it the benefit of the doubt here. Now let's talk cost. The Mac Studio is in its top SoC spec with 64 GPU cores, 64 gigabytes of RAM, and one terabyte of storage, and that costs a whopping $5,000. The PC is a little bit trickier though, because it depends on how you value the RTX 3090. All the parts I bought from Micro Center and Amazon add up to $1,753 but I bought my RTX 3090 back in 2020 at retail, which was $1,800. So if you count that, then the PC costs $3,553. But if you wanna be more realistic and use the going price for a 3080 right now, it's around $2,200. So the total cost would then be about 3,953. So regardless, we're still saving around a thousand plus dollars off of what Apple is offering with this setup. And if you price it out with DDR5 RAM, the PC ends up being somewhere around $4,400 or $4,500, so still a saving of five or 600 bucks. So given this pricing context, what kind of performance differences are we looking at here? Well, let me start you off with the synthetics so I can explain why they're pointless. 
In Cinebench R23, the Mac Studio sees a respectable 24,190, but the non-overclocked i9 comes in with 26,555. In Geekbench 5, we see this reversed. The M1 Ultra scores 24,055, and the i9 gets 18,472. But then, in Geekbench Compute, the 3090 dumps all over the Ultra, scoring 226,143 compared to 106,081. However, in GFX Bench Aztec high tier off screen, we see a rather close 494 FPS for the Ultra compared to 505 on the 3090. And then in V-Ray, a CPU test that runs in Rosetta on the Mac, the M1 Ultra manages to beat the 12900K by a fairly sizable and rather surprising margin. But then again, in Basemark GPU, which is Apple Silicon native, the 3090 crushes the M1 Ultra. These results are perplexing. In one CPU test, Intel smokes it. In another, Apple Silicon does. Same with graphics. And that's just one demonstration of how tricky it is to compare these machines. It's hard to say, you know, M1 Ultra is more powerful than X because it depends on what you're doing with X. Take gaming for example. Here's the Mac Studio running the Rise of the Tomb Raider benchmark at 1440p on the highest possible settings. Now, if you run this benchmark, you will get a very consistent 122 FPS, which is incredible for a, a game that's a Mac port running in Rosetta. And if you run this exact benchmark on the PC with an RTX 3090, you'll get somewhere around 106 FPS on the same settings, which is pretty mind blowing that this is actually faster. But that's until you realize that this is a, a fairly old game at this point that's also coincidentally extremely well optimized for metal and works really well with Apple Silicon. Other games, they're not this lucky. In another game, Hitman, you can find that 1440p on the highest possible settings gives us around 48 FPS on average compared to the PC's 175 on average. In another title, Cities Skylines, the Mac is borderline unplayable. It, it almost doesn't make sense that we're seeing frames as low as 24 or 25 when I've even gotten higher frame rates out of the M1 Max with half of everything, GPU and CPU cores. Optimization is the name of the game here, people. And as for other AAA titles, well, I've kind of run out of the ones that I have on both PC and Mac that will actually run on the Mac. There are some ways to get around these limitations with stuff like crossover, so let me know if you'd like to see me make a video on gaming with the Mac Studio and what that experience is like in the comments below. Depending on what you're doing, the Mac Studio can either be a beast or, to be honest, a little underwhelming. For example, in Puget Bench for Premiere Pro, I found that the Mac Studio absolutely smokes the PC in terms of its overall score, and in terms of graphics, the score of 95.9 for M1 Ultra is really keeping up with the 3090's 96.2. So the fact that we see graphics scores that are pretty much the same, but a much higher overall score, that tells us that those media encode engines are doing a lot of the heavy lifting. However, if you head over to Blender, which doesn't use the media encoders, we basically flip the script again. If you run the coveted classroom test on the CPU, you'll find that the M1 Ultra takes about 16 seconds longer than the 12900K, a gap reminiscent of the Cinebench run we did earlier. But switch over to GPU, oh boy, 89 seconds on the M1 Ultra, 15 on the 3090. The BMW render shows a similar tale. Running it unoptimized on normal mode in both machines, M1 Ultra takes 14 seconds longer. But switch on metal and optics, and the 3090 takes just seven seconds to render compared to M1 Ultra's 34. It's a bloodbath. In terms of thermals, the Mac Studio earns a massive W here. When running Cinebench, we see temperatures across all 16 performance cores just barely creeping into the mid 60 degrees Celsius range. The fans are all but inaudible and are barely stretching themselves at all. Now, when running Cinebench, if you do max out the fans, the temperatures will fall a little bit from the mid-60s down to the high 50s. 
but honestly, it seems like the M1 Ultra has more to give. It doesn't really make that much difference to the temperatures, whether we're running at 1300 RPM or the full 3400 RPM. To me, that indicates that there could be some performance left on the table. Meanwhile, the 12900K with a 280mm water-cooled rad and two 120mm fans situated right by the case intake are giving us alarming 90 degree temperatures. This case and rad setup is just not good enough for a 12900K. I would ideally like a top-mounted 360mm rad AIO and a case with fully ventilated mesh front panel in order to feel comfortable cooling this monster of a chip. And this is an important thing to keep in mind. You can point at performance differences all day long, but the fact of the matter is this. No computer exists right now that is as powerful as the Mac Studio while also being as small. It's not possible. Apple is the only company on the planet who can pull that off right now. And that's really impressive. So what we're seeing with these tests is that it's very hard to draw direct comparisons in terms of performance between these types of machines. Because Apple Silicon isn't x86 and x86 isn't Apple at least not anymore. You can cherry pick from these benchmarks to make it seem like the Mac Studio is faster or vice versa, but really it depends on what you're doing. If you wanna play AAA games, you're gonna buy a PC. If you wanna video edit, then the Mac Studio is definitely the way to go. But if you wanna do 3D modeling, well, the Mac Studio could be good, but it's not very well optimized right now, and right now the PC is much faster. So that's why for me, performance doesn't really paint the full picture. Uh, as much as it is relevant to talk about, you know, which is faster in Blender, this one, versus which is faster in video editing, this one, it's also important to talk about things like thermals. The Mac Studio has very good thermals. And this particular PC setup with this particular Core i9 does not. It seems crazy given just how much heat sink is actually inside of this thing and the one, two, three, four, five, six fans that are in this machine versus the two in here. But these are things you have to keep in mind. This is an objectively much louder machine than the Mac Studio, which barely ever leaves idle fan speed. If that's important, then that's something that you'd wanna know. But conversely, where the Mac Studio excels in efficiency and thermal management, the PC excels in upgradability. If you don't like this particular thermal envelope, which you probably don't, because it's not great, you could very easily just buy a different PC case that could fit a 360 millimeter rad and just put the whole thing together in a different configuration. You could swap out a motherboard and add DDR5 if you decided that was relevant, or if you're like me, you could save hundreds of dollars and go with DDR4. The ability to customize is pretty obvious if you're in the PC space, but if you're in the Mac Studio space, what you buy is what you get, basically for the entire lifespan of the product. I've got three NVMe SSDs in here and I still have an empty slot. The Mac Studio also has an empty slot, but they won't let you use it. And yet you can't deny that even though, yes, you're giving up that upgradability, this package is insane. The fact that it can be compared in certain applications to this system, and in some cases actually be faster than it, while being this small is truly insane. I mean, the amount of power that Apple is able to get out of a Mac Studio that is roughly the size of the power supply of this PC boggles the mind. This entire system consumes as much power as the graphics card in this one. It, it really is impressive what Apple has been able to do here. But at the end of the day, we're talking about desktops and that complicates things a little bit. Efficiency is obviously a huge benefit when it comes to a laptop because it means you can have great performance while also not having roaring fans and a five inch thick enclosure. With a laptop, you feel those benefits every time you pick it up and use it, but with a desktop that sits on your desk, I don't know, maybe it's not as big of a deal. But we could sit here for 
three or four hours going tit for tat back and forth on these machines. But the truth of the matter is, if you are buying a Mac Studio, you are beholden to optimization, Rosetta 2, which applications are meant to work on it and which have to be adapted. That's a matter of life. This thing will get better as time goes on. But for right now, that's the reality. But that being said, a workflow is more than just render times. And for me and for I know a lot of people out there, Mac OS and the integrations that come with it are a tangible benefit. I mean, the fact that I can take B-roll on my phone and airdrop it over to the Mac Studio in seconds, that alone saves me a ton of time. So benchmarks, comparisons, performance metrics, those are all important, but they don't necessarily tell you whether a machine is right for you. That is gonna be up for you to decide. So leave a comment down below. Let me know what you think of this comparison. Do you think the Mac Studio is impressive or underwhelming? I'm definitely interested to see your guys' thoughts on this. As usual, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.